uh, November 15th, 2016. That was the day that Big Van Vader went on Twitter. I still call him Big Van. He hasn't been Big Van Vader probably since 1995, but I still call him Big Van Vader. He went on Twitter and he posted the following. He said, Told by two heart doctors that my heart is wore out. I have been given less than two years to live. I am only now allowing this as part of my reality. Vader died on Monday night. Uh, Leon White did. Vader will uh, live forever. All these guys, I mean, the Roddy Pipers and the Macho Mans and the Ultimate Warriors, you know, their wrestling personas will, will live forever because of things like YouTube and the WWE Network and the video games and the action figures. Uh, it just makes it impossible for people to forget them. Uh, Vader is not somebody that you can easily forget. I said this on Twitter, how, you know, if you look at, I mean, how many 400 plus pound men can you think of who, who can do or did do moonsaults fairly routinely too, uh, off the top rope? I can't think of many, you know, someone said Bam Bam Bigelow did them, which is true. He did. And Bam Bam is one of the best big men ever to be in the ring as well. Uh, but he wasn't 400 plus pounds. And you got to remember, you know, when Vader started doing those moonsaults, he was already a headliner in WCW. It's not like guys do crazy moves in, you know, the early part of their career to get noticed. Mick Foley put his body through hell because he felt he had to. He wasn't a great wrestler. And so what do you do to get attention? You throw yourself off the apron onto the exposed concrete floor. You, you tell people to just, you know, <laughs> legit rough you up. You take crazy bumps. So you would think a guy like Vader, maybe he was doing it to get noticed. No, Vader was already a world champion many times over when he started busting out moonsaults in these big matches. He didn't have to do it. I mean, it reminds me of uh, Big Show telling the story of when he used to do moves off the top rope in WCW. You know, he used to do, uh, he used to do like missile drop kicks. I don't think he ever tried a moonsault, but he would do stuff off the top rope. And uh, I think it was, it might have been Hogan who went to him and said, stop, you're a giant. You shouldn't be doing moves off the top rope. Well, you know, Vader said, fuck that. Uh, Vader was a tough guy. The famous match, of course, with Stan Hansen in Japan got a lot of play this week on social media. People were talking about it. Uh, his failed run in WWE, I call it failed. I mean, he had some success, but let's be honest. I mean, Vader as a headliner was a failed experiment. In WWE, uh, you know, the which, by the way, WWE being the only place that he was never truly the top guy. He was the top guy at some point everywhere else that he went uh, across multiple continents. But somehow, WWE could not get it right with Vader. Uh, but the match with Hanson, where Hanson popped his eye out of his socket, what did Vader do? He pulled his mask off and he pushed that shit back in and he continued the match. That's badass. I can remember watching him in WCW. I, I mean, I wasn't much of a WCW fan at that time in the early 90s. I was sort of forced into watching it when I, I would be at my grandparents' house on Saturdays. They had cable. We didn't. And my grandfather would always watch WCW Saturday night, and there was Vader. And he scared the shit out of me. You know, he scared a lot of kids back then. He probably scared a lot of adults, too, when they saw their names opposite his on the board backstage. Uh, which I actually think is something that's missing in wrestling these days. A guy a guy in New Japan like a Minoru Suzuki is pretty terrifying, but he's no monster like Vader was. There's no one in WWE right now who can scare you the way that Vader did. Not even Brock Lesnar. Lesnar may be the closest thing, which is why he still kind of sort of feels special, but there's no one like Vader anywhere up and down that roster. Um, Vader was stiff. He hurt a lot of people. I'm, I'm not saying that I miss that. Or that we should have more people injuring others. But, you know, he was a, a stiff worker who who hurt people. And he broke a guy's back once on a power bomb, And he damn near killed Mick Foley. Even if Foley did ask him to do it, he beat him half to death in those matches they had in WCW. Those matches, though, are arguably what put Foley on the map. Uh, and Foley posted his own Facebook blog this week about Vader's passing. He was very close with him. He was very upset that Vader never got inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame before his death. The Hall of Fame meant a lot to Vader. Uh, you know, for all the joking that's done about what the Hall of Fame does or doesn't mean, as fans, right, we have those discussions and debates about what it actually means. Uh, to Vader, it meant something. And he badly wanted to go in. He was not shy about that. Uh, two years ago, he jumped the gun. 
and he teased the Hall of Fame announcement on his Twitter account, but he never got inducted. Instead, he was invited, and maybe that's what he was teasing. But, you know, he put a picture of the Hall of Fame logo up there, and immediately people said, hey, wait a minute, are you going into the Hall of Fame this year? Turned out he was invited to do the induction for Stan Hansen, the same man who popped his eye out. Which led to a funny moment during uh, Vader's speech for Hansen, where Vader wore those silly glasses with the eyeball hanging out like a, like a slinky to uh, sort of poke fun at the incident. But to go back and watch him on that stage and realize that he was the one inducting someone else and that he never got his own moment up on that stage while he was still alive, I think Mick Foley is absolutely right to be upset about that. Uh, and it was the same deal with Randy Savage. I will never forgive Vince McMahon. Uh, for dragging his feet on that and waiting until after Savage was dead to put him into the Hall of Fame. Um, you know, if, if for no other reason, because it deprived all of us, right, selfishly, of the chance to hear a pretty damn entertaining Hall of Fame speech. Uh, he should have been a slam dunk entry years before he passed away, uh, that being Savage. And, and Vader is a slam dunk guarantee, too. You know, I don't think anybody doubts that Vader is going to get a Hall of Fame induction at some point. He deserves it. He was a big star, made a lot of money, worked with top names, was champion everywhere he went, uh, and could do things in the ring that nobody else's size could do. I mean, he if you made a checklist, you know, he checks off all the boxes of what you would look for in a Hall of Famer. Uh, he made a lot of money, you know, pretty much everywhere he went as well. So uh, maybe the most athletic super heavyweight in all of wrestling ever. You know, tons of classic matches. He gave Sting some of the best matches of his career. I love those matches. You know, when I did my uh, top 15 WCW matches of all time list, the whole countdown I did a few years ago here on the Sound Off, um, Sting versus Vader, Starcade 1992, the finals of the King of Cable tournament, was on that list. Uh, you know what else was on that list? Vader's match with Ric Flair at Starcade 1993, one of the all time great WCW matches. Uh, he had great matches with Cactus Jack. Uh, in WWE, he, the match he had with Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam back in 96 was a damn good match. Uh, you know, one one that doesn't get as much love, I don't think, but he was also a very big part of it, and certainly he left a lot of blood in the ring during this match, was that Final Four match at In Your House in 97. It was him, Undertaker, Bret Hart, and Steve Austin. Uh, that was also a pretty damn good match. So, the man's resume speaks for itself, and to drag their feet, whatever their reasons were, and I'm not even saying that Vince McMahon had it in for Vader, there were nefarious reasons, they were worried about him embarrassing the company, I mean, there's no indication that any of that is, is, is the case. It's pretty much just something on the whims of one man. Vince McMahon ultimately makes the call about who goes in and who doesn't. And whatever their reasons were to not put him into the Hall of Fame, knowing, knowing that he had very little time left to live, is a disgrace. It is an absolute disgrace. So now he'll get in next year, or he'll get in the year after that, and his son can accept on his behalf, and this dark cloud is just going to hang over this induction, this dark cloud of, of sadness and people being angry, instead of the conversation being about what a well-deserved induction. Hey, I'm, I'm glad the man is going to have one last moment. This is really cool. Vader was a good wrestler, blah, blah, blah. It's not even, it's not even going to be about that. It's going to be about all this hatred now towards WWE. Why didn't you induct him when he was alive? And and it shouldn't be about that. It should not be a, it shouldn't be an angry moment. It should be a happy moment. It should be a fun moment. And And that, I think, is the most shameful part. But when he came to WWE in 1996, his very first night on Raw, he beat up Gorilla Monsoon. And even today, if you go back and watch that angle, which I did the other day, it still holds up after all these years. It was a, it was a great way to portray him as this raging, sort of uncaged monster. Uh, now, they did that to give him time off to heal a shoulder injury. He came into WWE, his shoulder was already hurt, so... That's the reason why they, they did that and took him off TV for a while. But by the summer, and, and I know Jim Cornette, who uh, managed him, has talked about this. He was supposed to win the WWF title at SummerSlam that year, or if not SummerSlam, at Survivor Series. But certainly by November, he was supposed to, at one point, be the WWF champion. Now, I, I think, I think, the plan initially was SummerSlam, and then either Vince McMahon just changed his mind... Or Shawn Michaels bitched and moaned about it, and, you know, what else is new? And he got it changed. And at that point, they were going to put the title on him instead at Survivor Series. But in the end, Vince decided to go with Psycho Sid. And to be fair, Sid, for those who don't remember, was super over <laughs> in 96. When they brought him back that summer when the Ultimate Warrior, you know, basically got fired, 
and they brought in Sid to replace him in this six-man tag for one of their pay-per-views. Sid was back. Within a couple of months, he was one of the most popular stars in the entire company, um, especially at Madison Square Garden the night that he beat Sean to win the championship. I mean, they, they, they cheered Sid. By and large, they cheered Sid and booed Sean. So, you know, Sid never would have even won the championship if Vader didn't save his life in the, uh, in the Scissors incident in WCW with Arn Anderson. That's a whole other classic story. Remember Sid and Arn's infamous hotel room brawl? And I think Sid was the one who grabbed the pair of scissors to use as a weapon. He ends up getting stabbed himself. He stumbles into the lobby. Vader sitting at the bar with Steve Austin wearing nothing but his boxer shorts. There's a visual for you. And he turns, Vader turns, and he sees Sid's his tag team partner at the time. He turns, he sees Sid just blood gushing from this hole in his stomach. And Vader sticks his thumb in the hole to stop the bleeding. And and Vader used to say, like in shoot interviews, he would say, you know, I never even got a thank you from Arn Anderson for saving him from a possible murder charge. But anyway, um, WWE missed their chance with Vader. Uh, that year, I think at SummerSlam, that was the time if you were going to put the championship on him and give him a monster run, it, it should have been then. It should have been then, rather. It should have been at SummerSlam. That's when they really should have done it. And and you had plenty of stories at the time about Shawn Michaels working with Vader on house show loops and bullying him, and Vader would be a little, a little, little stiff with him, and Shawn was having none of that. He would threaten in the ring during the match. He would like yell at Vader and threaten, I'm going to tell Vince I'm going to get you fired. And, and Jim Cornette would say that Vader would come backstage to the locker room. He'd be crying. He'd be in tears. Oh, Sean threatened he's going to take my job away. He's going to talk to Vince and get me fired. And I think it was, um, you know, so so it was not just the whole Shawn Michaels thing, but I guess just Vince never saw him as being somebody who could be that top monster heel in the company. It, you can't just lay the blame on Shawn Michaels for being a dick back in 96. I mean, I'm sure that didn't help. But at the end of the day, Vince McMahon, if he wanted to go with Vader, he would have gone with Vader. And maybe he just looked at Vader and said, well, he's he's too overweight, or he I don't see what the appeal is, or, you know, he's too stiff with the other, you know, the other performance. Whatever it was, I don't know. You can't get in, inside Vince McMahon's head. Um, but they just did not go with, with Vader. He never reached his full potential as a monster heel in WWE the way he did everywhere else that he went. Um, I think it was Mike Johnson on PWInsider.com who mentioned something I had not previously been aware of. This is my first time hearing this, which is that there were plans at one point to put the Intercontinental title on Vader in 1997. This would have been sometime after WrestleMania. Uh, but then came the incident in Kuwait, where Vader roughed up a TV host who asked if uh, wrestling was fake, which is not something that you should probably be asking someone like Vader. Uh, Vader thought that was very insulting. He ended up being detained there on house arrest for about two weeks, and plans were changed, and Vader never did get that IC title. Uh, in fact, he never held any championship in all the years he spent in WWE, which really, I, I guess it really wasn't that long. I mean, he came in in early 96, and by what, mid to late 98, I think he was gone. And he came, he had sporadic returns here and there years later, but basically... Yeah, I mean, I guess basically his run was really only about two and a half years in uh, in WWE, but he never held a, a single title the entire time he was there. Uh, he did win a Slammy, though. He did win a Slammy Award for attacking Monsoon, so there is that. Uh, but the Kuwait thing is great. If you've never seen it, it's up on YouTube. Um, it's Undertaker and Vader, right? So the, the both of them, they're on this Kuwaiti, I think it was like a morning show. And Bruce Pritchard has talked about this. Pritchard has said that they both knew the question about wrestling being fake. They supposedly knew the question was coming. Uh, they were tipped off about it. Undertaker said, look, I'm going to handle it. The company did not want either of them acting unprofessional. They did not want anybody cursing or anything like that. Remember, you're also in a foreign country. The laws there are a lot more strict. So they knew the question was coming, but Undertaker was going to handle it, and it was going to be fine. Um... So if you watch the video, Undertaker answers the question in a very, I would say, diplomatic way. And then when the host sort of goes to move on or ask another question, Vader... Now, Vader is sitting there listening to this the entire time, and you could see the look on his face, like, uh-oh. He, he, like, you could see the, the blood sort of boiling there. And when the host goes to move on, Vader interrupts, and he says, well, you know, I, I'd like to have a chance to respond to that question, if you don't mind. And what makes this whole thing even better, what makes this whole thing that follows even better, is that there's like this elevator music playing in the background. I don't know, it just makes the whole thing funnier. 
So Vader ends up, you know, he's... He, at first, he's being very respectful and just telling the guy why he feels so insulted by this question. And the host tries to, like, well, it wasn't my question or something, and that's it. Vader just snaps. He overturns the table that's in front of them. He very violently grabs the host by his necktie. He gets up. Vader stands up. The guy's still sitting down. And he looks down. He's like, does this look fucking fake to you? And the entire time, Undertaker's got, he's got the, the winged eagle belt in his lap. He's just sitting there. He's got sunglasses on like Cool Hand Luke. He ain't moving a muscle. He's, he's like paralyzed, just sitting there watching this whole thing. Uh, not saying a word, not doing anything. And all the while, this elevator music is playing in the background. But uh, Vader later on, he, he claims the whole thing was staged by the producer. The thing is, they never clued in the host about what was going to happen. And the host was scared to death. He pressed charges, and that's why Vader got detained. He had to pay a fine. Whatever the true story, I think everybody should go back and watch that video if you've never seen it before. Um, but, you know, looking at the, kind of the, the latter part of his career, especially in WWE, Vader did let his weight get out of control. Uh, that was one of the big knocks on him, and Jim Ross has talked about this. They sent him and Yokozuna to fat camp to try to lose weight, and then they found out not only did they not lose weight, they gained weight because him and Yokozuna were sneaking out at night to go find chicken, and they weren't losing any weight. So he had a big weight problem in WWE. There was that one pay-per-view in 98 where he, I think he lost to Kane, and they did a ringside interview with him when the match was over. And Vader gets on the mic and he calls himself a big fat piece of shit. He goes, I got, I'm just a big fat piece of shit. Live on the air. Um, but when he left WWE and he went back to Japan, which he did, I believe, in 99 and, and into 2000. he had, and, and at this point, he had to be in his early 40s. He had a career resurgence. And he actually became more like the Vader of old. So it really, you know, it wasn't a case of this guy's washed up. He's too banged up. He can't do it anymore. He proved when he left WWE and went back to Japan that he could still do it and he could still be a top star and, and, and a big monster and he had this career resurgence. And I think his lack of success in WWE because of that, I think, is more of an indictment on WWE, just not knowing how to use him other than, you know, you hear the excuses Vader had a bad attitude, which he probably did, and people complained that his ring gear was smelly and they didn't want to work with him, so, I mean, there were a lot of complaints and a lot of issues with Vader and WWE, but to me, it's all nonsense, that none of those reasons are an excuse that you could not have done more with this guy and really just built him up to be this, this big monster uh, who could have a, a good run for him, whether he's the champion or not. This big monster who could just go on and have a, a big run for himself, and it just never came. Um, I mean, I, I look at Vader, I kind of think, like, Vader was Brock Lesnar before there was a Brock Lesnar. Before Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman, you had Vader and Harley Race in WCW. And Heyman, let me just say, Heyman is a much better promo than Harley Race is, at least what when the part of Harley's career, at least when he was managing. Uh, Heyman is just light years ahead of him in that department, but... I mean, what a match in their primes. What a match that would have been, though, right? Vader against uh, Brock Lesnar. That, that's uh, one of those fantasy warfare type matchups there. Um, he had a lot of personal problems. He drank too much. He got hooked on pain pills. He was in a coma at one point for 30 days. Uh, his wife divorced him. I mean, the guy, the guy just hit rock bottom at one point. And what happened was he got hooked up with the Wounded Warriors Alliance, which is an organization that helps soldiers uh, who have been injured in combat uh, it's actually one of the things I wanted to ask him about when I tried to interview him many years ago. It didn't work out, but, you know, he would he would basically go around to their events and he would talk to these soldiers and he would tell them about all of his injuries and all of his concussions and surgeries and broken bones and his personal problems and, I, you know, try to use that as a way to sort of um, keep their spirits up, almost like in a motivational speaker type way. Uh, so he was doing some positive things in his life there towards the end, and it's just... You know, the whole thing, you look at it, and it's just, it's a damn shame that he won't have the chance now to tell that story himself one day at the Hall of Fame. But the way I look at it is this. He doesn't need the Hall of Fame to validate what he did in his career. Nobody does. Nobody needs the Hall of Fame. It, you know, it's a marketing tool. If it didn't exist, it's not like we're going to suddenly forget all these, all these different uh, legends and stars. Now, I know he probably feels like he did. For whatever reason, it was that important to him that he be inducted and acknowledged in the Hall of Fame. Whatever the reason, it was just very, very important to him. And so I know he felt like it probably meant, uh, you know, the difference between people remembering him and maybe people not remembering him. But if he never goes in to the Hall of Fame, and believe me, he will, even if he doesn't, though, it does not change the fact that he is still, in my opinion, the greatest super heavyweight of all time. 
uh, whatever your criteria for that is. I, I don't look at somebody, for example, like Undertaker and think, oh, he's a super heavyweight. He's a heavyweight, right? So I guess if I had to put a weight to it, maybe I'd say like 350 and above. Uh, but to me, there was nobody better than Big Van Vader.